welcome to Climate Fest. It is it's a great honor to be able to introduce to you somebody who really does exemplify the extraordinary leadership role that California is playing uh, an environmental, uh, with environmentalism and sustainability. And this is Felicia Marcus, of course, who was appointed by Governor Brown to the State Water Resources Control Board in 2012. She was designated by the governor to serve as the chair in 2013. This board is powerful, it's important, and it implements both federal and state laws regarding drinking water and water quality. It implements the state's aggressive water rights laws. And we're so lucky to have someone of the caliber of Felicia leading this, this, uh, this operation. And I've had the opportunity to travel with her. We went, we went as a group of a delegation to Australia to learn about the water efforts that they have, the drought control efforts that they have. It turned out, of course, the best way to get out of a drought I learned in Australia is to have torrential rains. Uh, and to some extent that worked for us too, uh, but now we're back in the same boat. But you'll, you'll see, you'll, you'll learn a little bit from, from Felicia about the, about the efforts moving forward and what, what California will be doing to address our long-term water, water needs and challenges. But she served as the regional administrator of the US EPA Region 9 in the Clinton administration. What a, wow, how great would it be to have her back in that role. Uh, check out the front page of today's LA Times, it's about the new guy. Uh, the board president of the LA Department of Public Works, she was, she was there too. She also has much more local roots, and she was co-founder and general counsel for our wonderful Heal the Bay, and I see Mark Gold here, of course, helped to lead that, or, or, that wonderful organization of prominence. Uh, she also was Western Director for the Natural Resources Defense Council that has its, its uh, Southern California headquarters right here at home in Santa Monica. She was an Obama administration appointee to the Commission on Environmental Cooperation Joint Public Advisory Council, which is the U.S., Mexico, Canada. And she was also a Schwarzenegger administration appointee to the Delta Stewardship Council prior to being appointed to the Water Board. She is an extraordinary leader. She's someone we're very proud to call our own. And without further ado, Felicia Marcus. Absolutely. Oh, you were still here. I thought you were going to leave. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Al. Um, you know, he is actually one of the coolest um, ever. He's, he's confident but humble, and that humility thing is not contagious in Sacramento, I'm just going to say. <laughs> he's energizing, smart, accessible, has integrity and creativity and strength. It's a great package. more like him, uh, much needed fresh air and what my grandfather would have called, the, his highest accolade would be, I really liked him, he's just like a regular person. <laughs> and I, it took me until well after my grandfather died to realize he was just translating mensch into English, <laughs> which it literally means a human being, that's what it means. So thank you all for the honor of addressing you today and thank you Judy Abdo for asking me. Um, as, uh, as you heard, Southern California's home and Santa Monica Bay holds a special place in my heart, not only personally, I spent a lot of beach hours there and I spent a lot of time with my dermatologist as a result of my <laughs> high school years. I, I, I won't say it was where it was always spray painted, Val's go home, sorry, from the Val, but I came here all the time. But also professionally as a founder and the original attorney for Heal the Bay, uh, and the person that hired Mark Gold, that's what's going to end up being on my tombstone. I spent most of my early career around protecting and restoring Santa Monica Bay, and as part of that, I got to work with a dedicated bunch of activists and elected officials, but also got to see Santa Monica itself become a pioneer in solutions on the ground to deal with water, waste, and air pollution problems, whether it was becoming a national pioneer in uh, recycling or stormwater capture and treatment or smart landscaping or dealing with groundwater pollution in an aggressive and future-oriented manner. When you think about the MTB disaster of the, uh, I remember what the water used to taste like too, um, in, the, in the 80s and the 90s, they really turned it into an opportunity to work towards water independence in a way that is just uh, extraordinary and really impressive. So it's a progressive and can-do community, most importantly, as dedicated to good words, but also action on the ground. And that will be part of my theme today. Because to meet the challenge of climate change, 
Have I not? I haven't lived the same. I just have a pretty picture, that's all. Um, to, meet the, to meet the challenge of climate change, uh, we have to act. Uh, we can't tweet it away, we can't Facebook it away, we can't dinner party conversation it away, even though we have to do all of those too. I'm not dissing them, but we really at CORE have to act, and we have, have to act differently than we have until now. We have to transform our discourse and our thinking from siloed, single-issue sound bites to complex and, yes, expensive, but ultimately cost-effective integrated solutions. We have to honor and support the myriad players of myriad political and ideological views in varied locales across this state and find ways to change things on the ground versus debating past each other about who's more holier than the next. This is the right place to use that metaphor. Anyway, we can't be sanctimonious. No, not that one either. Wait, we have to make sure that we're actually figuring out how to work together versus who's better uh, than the other. And we need those both and solutions rather than either or discussions. And we need to be, have our dialogue to be about how we can better our communities and our resilience and our health versus who is good and who is bad. Climate change is the defining issue of our times. It can be the giant sucking sound that distracts us all and divides us all. Or it can be the challenge of our era to figure out how to rise above the is so, is not level of discourse and get into action, preparing for the disruption to come. And it will come. I'll tell you now before I launch into some of the ways in which climate change threatens our already precarious water position in California that I am an optimist, because I have to be but also because I think it's a more effective way to live. And because it's only by being an optimist can we achieve the reverse of what a pessimist predicts and can be paralyzed into inaction about. So what's climate got to do with it? What's it got to do with water? Well, everything. And I'm just gonna give you a taste of that. Senator Allen already talked about the water board. We do a whole bunch of stuff, let me just say that. Happy to say more in the water panel to come. But here's the problem. Is it, is it unstoppable? Is it horror beyond understanding? Is it undefinable? Well, in some ways, yes. But actually, it's uncertain, but not completely unpredictable, unstoppable, or beyond our ability to both actively mitigate its impacts and slow it down and cope with it in a really effective way that not only holds the tide back, what actually makes our communities more sustainable and better and implements the things that are good no matter what and which people should be able to uh, agree on across the aisles. So here's the whole story of water in California. People wonder why I always use this elephant, but it's because I think of that metaphor of the blind man and the elephant where they're all putting their hands on this creature and defining it and defining something completely different that couldn't possibly come together. And that's one of our big issues and problems in California water, because it's not one thing, even though the discourse would have you think it's just that one thing. And so uh, my goal today is to give you a taste, as quickly as I can, because I know that we're running late this morning. We want to get into discussions and panels and trainings and the like. But I'm just going to arm you, at least for dinner party conversation just to give you a sense of how complex it is, what some of the solutions are, what some of the issues are, so when the people come in that typical political discourse and say it's just this one thing, and if those insert epithet bureaucrats or activists or farmers, wherever people want to blame for something, oil companies that they come to come to mind, would do this one thing, we wouldn't have any problems, you can say that's nonsense. It's actually complicated but it's not unactionable. We just have to do a whole bunch of different things that are all good in their own right and that regular people on the ground understand far better than the talking heads, the politicians, lawyers, and lobbyists who feed on fragmenting us, who feed on the, the politics of distraction and keep us from the kinds of actions that can improve our communities and make California that much better. So what are the key things, and I'll talk more about this in the panel if need be, that you need to know. I'll show you some quick pictures to illustrate, but California water is different than other states. We have the most variable hydrology, year to year, location to location, and season to season, of any of the states in the nation, including the rest of the arid southwest. 
Well, that's going to mean some things when we move forward, and, with, and it's going to be harder with climate. Every area has a mix of sources. There's not one big pool of water that we all share. Every area has a different, some have groundwater, some don't. In this area, people are hundreds of miles away from where most of their water is and don't know where it comes from. It's not, it's complicated. They don't need to know. They get it from the Eastern Sierra. They get it from the Delta or through the Delta from the Northern Sierra, Western Sierra. And they get it from the Colorado River if it's surface water. And then there's that whole mix of groundwater, some of which is highly contaminated, but it can be treated. That's not rocket science anymore. That's just the application of dollars and energy to separate the schmutz from the water molecules. That's the same as sewage treatment. We can do it, but you have to figure out how to do it in an intelligent way so that you're not using more greenhouse gas emissions to treat more than you need to. So it, it all comes together. Again, regular people understand this. Uh, a lot of lobbyists and lawyers and seemingly some elected officials do not, who are very much different from uh, Senator Allen. So you have this very different mix, including a different mix of water rights. That means that the solutions in each community differ widely. There's, again, not that one thing, that if we fund that one thing, it will solve the whole problem. It will solve somebody's problem or make it easier. But the way we have to solve this problem is through a sustainability lens, but also one that's not afraid of complexity uh, and local differences. Um, and then finally, in the basics, we've got 38 million people now. I think it's up to 39-something. We're going to have 50 by the turn of the century. That's not going to change. Um, the majority of our population does live far, very far from where their water comes from, and don't have that tangible sense that other communities have. They generally can count it. Ninety-eight percent of them can count on it coming out the tap and it being affordable. That two percent that doesn't is probably lower than in a lot of states, but it's still way too high for California in 2018. I'll talk about that. Um, a little bit, but folks in rural California, they know where their water comes from and they don't count on it coming out the tap in a clean, safe, and affordable way. We need, we're one of only five Mediterranean climates in the whole world that can grow the level of healthy fruits and vegetables that we want everybody to be eating more of. That is a precious resource that sometimes people will wave away as just big ag. No, that's food. Now, is every farm Farm and farmer great? No, not necessarily. Is everything made sense? But as a whole, casting agriculture aside is a huge mistake for everyone who eats, and everyone who actually cares about healthy food, and cares about people across this California, people across this country, and around the world. So it's not a simple just get rid of ag and we'll all have plenty of water for our pools and our lawns. I mean, think about it. it it's, a, it's a much more complex question and something that's precious, and we have to figure out how to manage. We have the most biodiversity in the country. We're losing it faster than anywhere else in the country. Um, and our institutional setting is a whole other story, which is we have more water districts of smaller size than anywhere, and that makes it hard to have a conversation. And then finally, there's Australia, where, and I'll just give you a key, a key factor for us to understand in terms of water, you know, for the last hundred or so years since we've been keeping records before this last drought, our droughts have lasted around three years, our worst droughts. This one lasted five. Australia had the exact same hundred year record of around a three year drought. And in the mid 90s, they had a three year drought. And they thought, well, surely it'll rain next year. And they did that for about six years. And then as their water supplies dwindled and all of that, then it rained a little bit and they thought, phew. And then they had the three worst years in a row, and they had to spend billions on emergency desal plants that didn't even get turned on. Because Senator Allen said before they got turned on, they had torrential rains, and that government got booted out of office. And they paid for those facilities for years and years and years and years without getting a drop of water out of them. And their message to us was, conserve early. It is your cheapest, fastest way to build and give you time to figure out what to do. They also built all kinds of pipelines to take water from ag and take it to their major cities, but they were really in trouble and we did not want to get anywhere near that. So now I'm just going to give you some visuals to, oh, I already said that. Climate change, let me mention that. Climate change also a game changer. Why? And I'll show you in a minute. Because that variability I talked to you about, that's so variable, well, what does that mean? Well, it means you've got to store water somewhere. When it falls over multiple years or for uh, in different times of years, etc., 
our snowpack is one third of our storage in an average year. We're going to lose it under climate change. The pace uncertain, I have estimates, but we're going to lose it. We can't make that up with surface dams. The only thing big enough to make up for that is our groundwater basins. And until 2014, we hadn't even managed them at a statewide level. And so this change, if nothing else, a few degrees temperature rise, or more of the same level of precipitation falls as rain rather than snow, puts us in a world of hurt as we lose that snowpack that has been there quietly melting out during the spring and the summer, replenishing streams, replenishing rivers, and replenishing our reservoirs. So that is a freight train of pain coming at us that makes the conflicts that you hear about in the water wars between the environment and agriculture, between water users and environmentalists, between water users and each other, which is really a more fierce fight sometimes than the fish versus people meme, that's going to seem like a picnic compared to what's to come. So uh, my bottom line is we've got to get off our butts and off our talking points and do stuff, and that is what we're doing, and I'll flash through that quickly. That's just, that's us. Blue means more variable. We really are different. There you've got year to year. Here you've got the seasonal mismatch. It's for people like charts. We can talk about this in the next panel if you want. And then we have a big problem that where the rain comes from isn't where most of our people are. That's a problem. But it's, it's also a miracle. And why is that possible? It's through this incredible network of uh, federal, state, and local conveyances that were built during an era which ushered in this incredible miracle of food production, but also social and economic development. That is Southern California, but we did it before the environmental laws and environmental sensibilities, and it's also had a damaging effect on uh, our precious ecosystem restoration, uh, our ecosystem resources that are also part of our California heritage. And my board and other boards sit in that place of trying to rebalance that, which is where the big fights I live in are, and then I'm not going to talk about that much today. but. You can see where you are, and, and here water comes from the Colorado, uh, the Delta, and then local resources. And then there's groundwater depletion that we've heard a lot about that we could spend time on, but um, we've been depleting those resources far faster than nature can replenish them. The drought took it down even further, but we've also depleted it to grow more food and fiber for the rest of the world, which is a good thing on the one hand, but not a good thing if it, if it uh, it uh, sells the future of our grandchildren to be able to farm where it blames, ends up blaming uh, the ecosystem for something that's really not its fault. So we got problems. And here is that big one. This is the picture on the bathroom mirror to keep us motivated. This is what's coming at us, and this has to change our attitude about whether we can have business as usual in the water world or what they have to do with it. And this is where climate change has everything to do with water. Water also has a lot to do with the solutions because 20% of the energy and GHG emissions in California come from water distribution treatment and, uh, and uh, heating. Heating is a really uh, big one in terms of GHG emissions. And just to give you a little sense, the amount of water saved by Californians just in the urban context was actually a bigger net energy saver than all of our energy efficiency programs combined in the state. So using less water for a perfectly adequate and, and lush quality of life compared to 99.9% .9 of the rest of the world uh, is something that's definitely within our power and that we have to do more of. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but just so you know that um, we're not doing nothing, the governor, I guess it was four years ago, we came out with a plan for what we were going to do in five years to at least lay a foundation for a sustainable water future for California. We're going to fix it all, but we're going to lay that foundation that hopefully, you know, run the baton down the field and someone would carry it the next leg of the voyage, because these complex changes are not things that happen overnight. And it was very much an all of the above, not just pick one. And it worked very well to change a lot of the discourse in Sacramento, because everybody could see their thing versus arguing which one it was. We just said, hey, come on, get over yourselves. It's all of them. And we're, you can keep debating, but we're going to try and do all of these. Come with us you know, if you want to live, that sort of thing. <laughs> we'll talk about that more in the, uh, in the next session. So here you go. Thinking about the drought, I, you know, I, I went there and I found my uh, Ben Franklin um, 
favorite. Um, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. But this wasn't actually the one I was looking for, but I had to put it in anyway. When the well is dry, we know the worth of water. That's the one I was looking for. So then I talked already about that being the worst drought in modern times. Let's just show you. See that little red thing? That was our snowpack in 2015, the worst since Columbus. That was a fun day. Um, and you, you may have seen the picture of uh, Jerry Brown standing there declaring emergency proclamation with the poor guy in the red jacket who always has his staff to measure it. I always call him Gandalf, but his name is Frank Gierke. And it's just lying on the floor on the dirt because there just wasn't any snow there at all. It was frightening. But we've been variable before. We have high highs, we have uh, low lows. They're getting more extreme with climate and temperature rise. You can look up Noah Diffenbach's work at Stanford. That's going to happen more. Wider swings. We're luckier in the South Africa. Their predictions are they're just going to get drier. We're going to have those wider swings. It gives us a shot at capturing um, uh, the um, the winter wets, but we also have to prepare for them. But we are going to have drier dries and longer dries. So the drought is really uh, just going to happen more often and be longer. We're lucky this one was only five years. What kind of things happen? Well, you know, tens of thousands of people out of work, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres fallowed, um, people out of water, not having water out the tap, uh, fish and wildlife totally hammered. People in Sacramento scared to death when they saw pictures of Folsom. What are the, we did a lot of things, and you all, thank you for what you did um, to save water in the urban arena. Folks in the agricultural arena, we were having to make very tough decisions, uh, curtailing their water completely. Our water rights system is cruel. Um, we try to make it fair, but it's pretty harsh. Um, and we put uh, billions out for, uh, to goose recycling from the idea on the drowning board to into the ground, probably the biggest paradigm shift of our time. We got groundwater management passed. We did all kinds of uh, regulations, made all uh, kinds of tough um, decisions. But that being said, it was the wake up call of the century that we've got to deal with. The Godzilla of all, Nin all, all El Ninos did not save us, uh, but we have an opportunity to save ourselves. So let me just give you a sense of the future and the issues we're dealing with. And so I, you know, I was doing my late night Googling, and of course I came up with this. I'm a firm believer in the people. If given the truth, they can be dependent upon to meet any national crisis. The great right point is to bring them the real facts and beer. I swear to God, I wasn't looking for beer quotes. I was looking for quotes about reality and sharing info with the public, because I believe that Californians will do the right thing and care. And, and, and my divining thing is, what is right for Californians as a whole, not what is the expert chattering class saying at us in front of the microphones, which takes some work when you're in Sacramento. But I also didn't realize beer was such an important part of the thinking of our most famous folks. So I Googled John F. Kennedy and beer, Robert F. Kennedy and beer, Ronald Reagan and beer, and Martin Luther King and beer. And I got nothing. <laughs> but I did get this from Martin Luther. Whoever drinks beer, he is quick to sleep long. <laughs> does not sin. Whoever does not sin enters heaven. Thus, let us drink beer. <laughs> I kid you not. Is it true? I don't know. It's pretty cool. So here's the reality we're dealing with, that loss of snowpack. Our population's going to rise. Maybe we, it won't rise as much as it might have if we uh, you know, deal with it. I was an activist on that a long time ago. But it's going to rise. We're not going to be eating our young. Sea level's going to rise and cause a host of problems, whether it's in San Francisco Bay, the, Belta, the Delta along the coast, wherever you are. The Delta is an issue that has a lot of challenges. Sea level rise and climate change make those worse. There's a whole talk in this. Talk about it the next time we want. So, sorry, the Colorado's in trouble too, and they've been in a longer drought than we have. And frankly, um, warming alone could cause the Colorado River flow to decline 30 to 50 percent by the end of the century. That's huge for Southern California. Cal Southern California is 30 percent dependent on the Colorado, 30 percent dependent on flows through the Delta, and for wait, do the math, 40 percent. Uh, dependent on local sources, and people are putting their pedal to the metal to get more resilience there, and we're in a race against time. So anyone who asks you to help on that, help. Salt Sea's not a picnic either. Our fish and wildlife are in peril. Here's a prettier one, even though it's not salmon, um, but better graphics. 
Doubt is not even as scary as the last one I showed you. Agriculture we talked about. The lack of statewide groundwater management has been a, a problem for some of the reasons I mentioned and a lot more, and we'll talk about this in the, in the next panel. This is a guy standing in 1977, and that little sign at the top is where the ground was in 1925. Uh, we're now many years past, and that telephone pole is no longer there. <coughs> Groundwater depletion site I showed you. We also have an issue of contamination. If you're in a big urban area, you, know, you can afford to treat it. If you're in a small rural area, dependent on groundwater, this is a huge problem. It's probably the, the number one issue my board is dealing with. Our infrastructure is aging and inadequate to the times, not just because it can break and needs to be replaced, but because we need to be replacing it with more green infrastructure, sponge cities, stormwater capture, the kinds of things that uh, Santa Monica has pioneered. And frankly, we could be a lot more efficient, it, whether it's, it's lawns and leaks. Just from lawns and leaks, we can extend urban California to meet these challenges, frankly. We use 50% uh, on average in our urban areas, outdoors on ornamental landscaping. We need that, we need trees. We don't necessarily need lawns that look like they're a, a, a golf course greenway in Scotland in the middle of July in California. And Californians really responded well to that. Uh, during the drought, snapping up rebates to change out their lawns, because it's not cheap to do. And leaks can be up to 30% in urban areas. Plug up the leaks, that's a lot more water. And finally, I'll talk more about this in the panel so that we can, we can move on. Uh, we can do something about it. A lot of folks are doing it. It's more integrated water management. It's recycling. It's stormwater capture. It's, um, it, it's desal, particularly in those places that don't have groundwater basins that they can use to put the recycled water and the stormwater capture, but with rules that protect the marine uh, environment and folks are dealing with the energy there. So there are all kinds of things we can do. And then, I'm sorry, I didn't get through this. I can give you, I will in the next one, chapter and verse about incredible things happening on the ground. But in order to make it happen, frankly, we have to change the discourse. You get this sometimes in the agricultural community. But you also get this, dissing an almond or dissing a bottle or whatever as the true thing. There are problems with all of these, and there are problems with some regulations. But they aren't the whole problem, and they distract us from dealing with it. I can, you know, even thinking about beer, it, it takes a lot more water to make a beer than to make a bottle of water. The bottle's got some big problems. I'm not a fan of it. But it's not the water use problem, because we're not going to ban beer, at least not on my watch. <laughs> and to do that, as I move to a close, that, sorry, was I on it? The traditional dialogue, well, kind of, I, I used to just have the dial and I realized I was just dating myself, so I put in a remote, but I'm probably behind the times already, because now you can just talk to somebody, it's not Alexa yet, but you can just talk to something that will change the channel, so I'll have to get another one. But we need new skill sets. We can't just be smarter than the other guy. Nobody likes the smartest guy in the room, and it's not that effective, and it's arrogant. We also can't be the angriest guy in the world if we want to be effective, even when we're angry and we're justified in being angry. Now, you don't have to be Deanna Troy, I'm dating myself again, I know. You, you don't have to be Deanna Troy or Nelson Mandela um, to make it happen, but you at least have to take a breath and listen and embrace all those things we care about as Californians and come with that attitude if you want to get something done. And Yogi Berra, in theory, there's no difference. He, he didn't have a beer one either. The theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, and practice there is. We need more practitioners just doing stuff on the ground, because our discourse on water has to evolve. Our relationship with water has to evolve. It's an advertisement from Mark Gold right here. <laughs> That's how I justify having the mayor of another city. My apologies, Mr. Mayor. But what LA is reaching for is a game changer, and our relationship with each other has to evolve. And how do we get there? This clear-eyed future on those decades ahead, that freight train of pain coming at us versus the decades behind us. A focus on reality versus rhetoric and practical versus theoretical. Embracing complexity, embracing action over stasis, convergence over conflict, though there will be conflicts, all of the above versus either or, and most importantly thinking as Californians, ag and urban, ag and ecosystem, north and south, the Delta and the projects, agriculture and safe drinking water, we can do this. And it takes myriad acts of individual people making a decision. These are acts of love 
by millions of people every day to make different choices in how they use energy, how they use water, how they get to work, how they get to school. So thank you for what you do and your willingness to spend a Saturday learning to do more. All of us doing what we can will make that profound difference that we need to. And while there's no silver bullet or savior out there, although he might have been had he lived, he's my personal one. We are in motion in thousands of individual acts of courage and creativity and hundreds of regional efforts that never make the headlines. With that all of the above strategy that uses efficiency recycling stormwater capture using our groundwater basins as the precious resources they are storing more water in the wet even normal times, in the dry times for people and for fish and wildlife, uh, we actually have the ability working with natural ecosystems in nature and preparing for wider swings and extremes, we have the potential to maintain and enhance the healthy ecosystems, healthy agriculture, and healthy communities that all Californians really treasure. So thank you again for allowing me to spend the time with you today, and thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, but uh, I will say a few things before I send you off. So uh, today we are programming the whole campus at St. Monica's for you to engage and learn more about these topics. In this room, after this session, we're going to hear from Felicia Marcus, Melinda Weinrich, Mark Gold from UCLA, and Karina Sandique, also from the Office of Sustainability, talk more about water. Uh, where we're headed uh, locally and what else is happening around the state. Across the patio, we're, you're going to hear from uh, Citizens Climate Lobby talking about carbon pricing. Also, you can uh, attend a session around uh, climate change in general, climate science, hear from the climate reality leaders, which are trained by Al Gore uh, and his program. There's also uh, coastal science and stewardship for the Santa Monica Bay. So if you're interested in local ecological systems, how it's affecting Santa Monica Bay uh, from a climate change standpoint, you can also attend that session. Uh, also in the uh, Corriso Conference Room, which is in the building down the hallway, uh, you can hear from the documentary, the documentary backfire uh, about VW and its diesel fraud scandal. Uh, and the director who uh, is behind that movie, so, uh, he's here today and he'll, he'll be able to preview uh, that film for you. If you don't want to be inside, there's plenty of things to do outside. We have the Green Living Festival outside. We have over 40 environmental organizations out there waiting to uh, give you some resources. We have the Family Bike Festival if you want to get on a bike and test ride a cargo bike, a family bike, it's out there for you. We have child care for those who need it. Out on California, we also have a uh, ride and drive. So if you want to test drive an electric vehicle, that's there for you as well. Uh, we also have outside our, our Santa Monica's first and only uh, solar powered uh, EV charger. It's on its own, it, it's powered by the sun and it's able to charge uh, an electric vehicle uh, without being tied into the grid, which is pretty cool. Um, so before I let you go, I'm going to talk to you a few minutes briefly about what are we doing here locally, because we heard a lot about what the state's doing. Santa Monica is very active, as you know. We're working on what we're calling the city's next climate action and adaptation plan, because climate change is upon us. We're looking at planning for a horizon of 2030. That's where a lot of our other planning documents are going. We have a good history of, of climate, uh, climate action. We are reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Relatively, we're well ahead of where the state is. We're much further ahead of where the United States is as a whole. But what will it take? What will it take to get to carbon neutral and actually get to uh, the, the carbon neutral state by 2050, as uh, Mayor Ted Winter had said? So if we look at some of these trends, that's kind of the, the, the axis that we have to follow. These are some of the measures that we will take in order to get down towards those levels. We're going to have to achieve 100% renewable energy. We're going to have to reduce energy use across all of our buildings and facilities. We're going to have to essentially eliminate all the waste that we're sending to the landfill, make sure that we're recycling, composting, reusing it, whatever. We have to make sure that we're getting people out of their 
personal vehicles, getting onto bikes, getting on foot, getting on transit, getting on any kind of mobility service that's possible, and making sure that any of those vehicles that are still on the road are zero emission or electric and powered 100% by renewable power. So this is just a little bit of that uh, in more detail. And you will hear about all of this throughout the day in various sessions throughout the campus. We're going to talk about these high-minded concepts. We're going to talk about how are we going to collectively achieve these, uh, achieve these goals? What are the trends happening in these spaces that you should be aware of? And what are the resources that you can take uh, to, to, to be a part of it? And so if we do all of that, uh, we think that we could probably be somewhere along this trend where we're getting pretty close to maybe what it looks like around 2030, somewhere before 2040. It's not a promise. All of us have to do it, of course, to be a part to make sure that this progress happens. But that's what we think we can potentially achieve. It's very ambitious. So with that, I will send you off to enjoy the day. Please get social if you want. We have two hashtags we'd like you to use. Uh, again, the future of water is going to be here in this room if you want to stay here. Just outside of the patio, we have refreshments. There's food, there's coffee, there's tea. Um, we're going to have lunch at around 12.30, between 12.30 and 1 to follow shortly thereafter. And we have one more method. I, I also want to point out that the, the school district has several, the building next door here is called Duval, and downstairs at Duval is several exhibits from the school district, students, teachers, green architecture, but upstairs, a very, the, Frank Geary designed that building, by the way, there's this really cool room, and you can, they have tons of old t-shirts and five sewing machines up there, where you can turn, it's called upcycling. Instead of throwing them away, you turn it into something else. So t-shirts to trash all day, 11, 11 to 3, upstairs in Duval. They're... Thank you, have a good day. This is going to be a panel discussion on the future of water. So we're going to have three panelists. Mark Gold is the Associate Vice Chancellor for the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA. Felicia Marcus, as everyone met, is the chair of the California State Water Resource Control Board. And Karina Zendiki is a sustainability analyst for the City of Santa Monica Office of Sustainability and the Environment. And so how all the order is kind of set is big, big picture, we mark down to the state and then down to the local. Karina will talk about what our great city is doing. So with that, all right, well, let's just jump in. Um, so a lot of this is going to be, I'll, I'll skip through quickly some of the stuff that uh, Felicia covered. The problem with uh, Felicia and I both talking at the same time without us coordinating is we often say similar things, so um, not surprisingly. So one of the things that um, I get to do as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Environment and Sustainability at UCLA um, is work on the Sustainable Land Grant Challenge, and so I'm, I'm leading that effort, um, and it really stemmed from some work that was pretty critical that uh, one of my colleagues, Alex Hall, has done on downscaling global climate models um, on, on cities, and Los Angeles was the first city that that occurred on, and we looked at mid-century as well as end-century, and uh, without going into much detail, bottom line is, uh, much hotter um, in some places, uh, five degrees increase in temperature, um, uh, by end of century, in places like the San Fernando Valley, San Gabriel Valley, um, especially up in, uh, in, in the Antelope Valley as well. And so that's really what that says. So you can imagine the number of extreme heat days, and some of those areas can actually get to triple digits, you know, so 100 days a year that are going to be over 95 degrees. So pretty, pretty frightening to think of that that's what Felicia grew up. Um, and so some of the things that we're working on in the Grand Challenge, I'll focus on the water side, is um, uh, we, we adopted these crazy audacious goals, not as crazy on the energy side anymore when we first started talking about it in 2012-2013, which is getting to 100% renewable energy. But on the water side, to really say we want to get to water self-sufficiency, makes sense in Santa Monica, but try expanding that out to all of Los Angeles County, where 60% of our water supply is imported from more than 200 miles away. So obviously a big deal to sort of think about you know, what would it actually take to get there, and then also enhancing ecosystem health. So the things you see on water are pretty straightforward on um, 
uh, maximizing local water supplies, reducing water consumption, and improving local water resource management. Um, to date, we have uh, 45 different research projects that are underway, um, about split equally within the three areas, so around 15 or so in the water, the water space. Um, and uh, it involves over 75 different faculty on campus. So it's really been a big issue to get UCLA, if you know UCLA, a very siloed campus, very well known as one of the top research institutes, uh, you know, institutions in the entire world. But to get them to do something more applied and have an impact in their own backyard is almost a big grand, is a grand challenge is actually achieving sustainability in Los Angeles County. Um, and so it's been pretty exciting to actually work with faculty um, and really have them work across disciplines for the first time ever um, to do this kind of work. So this looks familiar. I think you just saw it. Um, and then are we back to the new normal? We had our wet year. Um, it, you know, people forget that wet in Northern California was not that much different than being slightly above the average here in Southern California. We had 22 inches of rain. Our, our average is about 15. So it wasn't anything like, oh, we saw the record snowpack in the Sierras, you know, two years ago. Um, we didn't obviously see that here. And then this year, even with the March rains, we're about five inches in the last really 13, 14 months. So, um, so, so the things that we're talking about, we're, um, you know, drought is over. I'm sorry, I don't think a governor should ever be allowed to say the drought is over. I, I really want to hear it from someone with a PhD. But um, uh, so from my perspective, you know, looking at, uh, you know, drought is over from the standpoint of looking at how full our reservoirs are. Um, and so that's good news is that we have enough water probably to last the next two, three years without being severely panicked. Um, but from the standpoint of looking at our own vegetation in the LA area, um, you know, we saw what happened this fire season and we hope to never see another fire season like that again. The drought is not over in Southern California in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I think we just saw that. And this is one of the results we hear about in Sierras, 130 million dead trees, um, you know, um, since 2010. Um, and obviously the fire risks are severe. And same thing here in our local community with Oak Woodlands and Chaparral and, and the like. Um, and so this is the worst um, that you saw, drought monitor of what California looked like. Um, really the entire state was in um, almost in severe drought during that time. This is how we look right now, which pretty much exemplifies exactly what Felicia was talking about. Northern California, not so bad. Southern California, um, this, this map will be getting more orange and red um, uh, every week between now and next October. Um, guaranteed, we're not going to have a rainy um, summer um, is the light. Now, this, this, these two slides are ones that, I'm sorry about the slides, but the, just bear with me in what I'm going to say, um, because I think it's really important, brand new uh, work that was done also by Alex um, Hall over at UCLA. Um, so, um, it, it, the climate modeling that he did the, uh, for Los Angeles, he did a very similar sorts of thing, sort of thing for the Sierra. And what he found was, um, frankly, absolutely horrifying from the standpoint of what is going to happen this year at mid and end of century. And so the sorts of things that was alluded to um, uh, by Felicia, just taking the next um, step, is the average temperature in the Sierra could increase um, anywhere between 7 and 10 degrees um, by end of century. Um, and uh, in, in really, the places where you would have the 10 degree increase would be at the very top of, um, of, of the mountains in certain parts of the Sierra. So the end result is you can pretty much kiss goodbye um, snowpack between four and 7,000 feet. Um, so that's something that's really pretty much going to be a thing in the past. So it's only going to be really high Sierra that you're going to see that. The big thing here is you're going to see a shift in hydrologic cycle by up to 10 to 12 weeks. So you, you know, getting peak flows in you know, normal times, you know, 10, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, you know, would be somewhere around, peak flows would be around May. You might start seeing peak flows as early as late February. Um, and so what does that actually mean? Well, it means a lot from the standpoint of our flood control system and how are we going to deal with that. So you're going to get much peakier um, extreme flows in that regard. Um, you're also going to have much higher water temperatures in our rivers and streams um, during the end of summer. So think about already the collapsing salmon um, uh, populations that we've already seen. A lot of that has to do with flow diversions, a lot of it has to do with warm temperatures, a lot of it has to do with water quality, but this obviously is not going to help what has already been 
um, you know, a devastating situation to um, the, the Bay Delta ecology, um, and, and obviously salmon, salmon runs in that regard. Now, what the impacts are beyond that, I think this sort of work, frankly, is going to lead to a lot more research from other people to, to start looking at what are the ecological impacts going to be because of the shifting hydrologic regime, which is absolutely terrifying. Um, so I just wanted you know, to bring that out as well. And then, you know, Alex, always the bearer of such wonderful news. Um, uh, you might have picked up on this in the last month, so this is just brand new stuff. Climate whiplash was, you know, Daniel Swain, um, who's his postdoc, just has a crazy gift for coming up with this stuff. I didn't, who knew ridiculously resilient ridge was going to catch on? I didn't. That was when he was a PhD student at Stanford, now he's a postdoc of Alex's. And, and really the point of this complex slide, which I need to break up into multiple slides, but I just got it yesterday, sorry about that, um, is that uh, it, it's really that the it, chances of extreme weather are going up dramatically. Um, and so if you sort of think about that we're already known for highly variable weather, that now those extremes are just going to go up more and more and more. And really we've had a great taste of that in the last seven years, right? Where we had the one extreme um, precipitation snowfall year, and then we basically had, besides that, you know, five, six years of drought. Um, and so we're going to see more and more of that. The thing that sort of caught the public's attention on this was looking at really the extreme weather event from the standpoint of, of flooding, sort of what happened in Houston. And people didn't even hear about it. Um, it was just sort of buried in the news. We had 50 inches of rain in Kauai in a 24-hour period um, a month ago. And I, I mean, I can't even get my head even remotely around that sort of change. And so it was sort of hearkening back to uh, the big flood event that had occurred in the Sacramento um, uh, Bay Delta area, some of those really old photos you've probably seen, and saying that there's a very high likelihood that a similar sort of event will occur by the end of century. So the more that our climate scientists are really looking at these issues and the impacts on water, frankly, the scarier it looks. Um, and, th and that's something that, you know, I guess I'm not the optimist that Felicia is, but anyone who knows, knows us both knows that. Um, and, so, um, and so that's something that, uh, you know, one thing, one of the many things that we do agree on is the same sort of effort that we have put towards trying to build reservoirs, which have been hugely controversial um, in various different parts of the state and have, have had, you know, some pretty devastating impacts on, on our riparian ecology. Um, we have not spent the same sort of effort on how do we take those peak runoff flows and get them to infiltrate into our ground. What's funny is we do it, we do it in SoCal, we do it in the Santa Ana River, we do it in the San Gabriel River watershed, we don't do it in the LA River watershed, we need to, that's a big priority, but we don't do it in the San Joaquin Valley, which is crazy. I mean, that's, that's really, when we talk about these water bonds and where we should be investing our money, we should be thinking about infrastructure and how to get more flows infiltrating into the ground when we have these really big peak flow years. Um, so those to me are, are sort of the, the, the big things. Um, I'm not going to get into the uh, backslide issue in, in any sort of thing on, on water conservation. Just to remind you though that as great as we did during the height of the drought when we had the mandatory cutback, um, it just makes you realize that unlike what we did in the past, like in the 90s, where we had toilet fixtures, exchange, etc., and so we're no, no more five gallon flush toilets, now we're down to like 1.28 or something like that, might even smaller than that. Um, so those are permanent sorts of changes. What we did really was kind of a community-based effort as a state. Um, and so it was all voluntary, and from the standpoint, it was all behavioral change. And so what we've seen is we bounced back to pretty much using pretty similar amount of water um, that, that we did um, sort of prior to the mandate on, on conservation. And so that's been pretty disturbing to watch. That changed, obviously, here's your good news, um, in March. Since we had such an incredibly wet March, you know, it makes it look like we're back to doing a decent job in conservation. Um, but we definitely had about a six-month trend of pretty significant backsliding, which is something to look at. Now, I don't have time, I don't think, to really go over some of the research in great detail than what we're doing, so I'll just give you a, a, a large overview. But some work I've been doing in the city of Los Angeles with a huge team of people from Colorado School of Mines and other faculty members and, um, and uh, a whole bunch of different grad students and postdocs is we've been trying to look at LA as a whole, the city of Los Angeles, similar to what Santa Monica is doing in trying to get to water self-sufficiency, 
you know, we're supposed to be there by 2020. Somehow had a little bit of a blip, but in 2022 we had earliest. Here in Santa Monica, the investments need to occur um, much, much more quickly. They have some money from the state water boards, um, state revolving fund to start building some of these projects. Um, really, how do we get more from our local water supply? Well, Santa Monica, right now we get somewhere between 80 85% of our water from our groundwater, which sounds pretty amazing, but you gotta remember back in the 90s, we got 0%. Um, because the NTBE crisis, we were pretty much down to zip. Um, and so this is a city that pretty much took matters into their own hands, went after the oil companies, um, uh, uh, and uh, um, really made an incredible difference, about 350 to $400 million in settlement for Santa Monica to take their water back. It's our, it's our right to our water. It's why we have a sustainable rights ordinance here in Santa Monica is because we deeply care about the environment um, at that level, and that was something that, that you know, we did even prior to that ordinance being in place. Um, and so I bring that up because Santa Monica has to figure out, okay, where are you going to get that next 20%? Whereas LA was, during the height of the drought, was 85 to 89% imported water from more than 200 miles wet. So that's a completely different calculus. You know, here we do a much better job on stormwater capture. We put in a small package water recycling plant, which is what the city's planning on doing. Um, do a better job on conservation. I see Linda sitting here. She's here to make sure that it's just what we do here as a city, and we've done, it, we've done a nice job sort of maintaining that to some degree, but we can do a lot better, as we see in places like Australia um, and Western Europe. Um, but uh, to do that in Los Angeles, what we ended up doing is we did this incredibly intensive modeling exercise of all the watersheds, trying to figure out if you retrofit them with nature-based solutions, low-impact development, how much more water can you actually get into our groundwater basins, um, also, what would be the water quality benefits of doing so? What's, what's the maximum amount of water we can get from recycled water? Think about it. Hyperion treatment plant back in the 80s, all we cared about was, oh my god, it's polluting the bay, we have a dead zone in the bay, we're having, we're having sewage spills that are closing our beaches for weeks at a time, this is absolutely horrible. Um, and so then it was all about complying with the Clean Water Act. Now it's like we see that sewage treatment plant discharging each and every day. Um, uh, 200 million gallons a day, they've reduced their, their flows dramatically because of water conservation. Um, and we're going, what a waste of water. How horrible. I mean, think how we've changed now I and mean, evolved in that regard. And so we need to change that plant to an advanced treatment plant, which we can do, um, and, and make sure that we actually use that as a recycled water resource. We need to capture the stormwater in the LA River. We're not doing that. 270,000 acre feet per year ends up going into San Pedro Bay. Um, in the Long Beach area near the Queen Mary. That's a lot of water that we could be capturing and putting into our groundwater basins. We have contaminated groundwater basins that we're just sort of letting sit there. We're finally, as a city in LA, um, investing money to actually make sure, following the city of Santa Monica's footsteps, pump and treat is something that can be done and cost effectively in comparison to other sources of water. Um, and so the bottom line is, that what we've seen, and then, you know, ordinances like we've had in Santa Monica, first in the entire state of California was on low-impact development, before anyone called it low-impact development. Um, the first stormwater ordinance was way back in 1992. I worked on that with Judy, among other people who are here. And, um, and so that sort of thing, what it shows you is, you know, if you put in an ordinance in place that changed the way we do new and redevelopment, and we can figure out especially how to deal with the retrofit issue would be even better. Um, is that you, you get this tremendous um, uh, benefit from the standpoint of increased water supply, reduced flood risk, and on top of that is um, tremendous uh, reduction in pollutant loads that makes the government investment um, greatly, greatly reduced on how you actually comply with the Clean Water Act and um, stormwater permit. And so this is something that you know we worked on modeling out a decade out to show how low impact development ordinances are just transformational in a big, big way. Um, and so this is something obviously Santa Monicans are also very familiar with. We've had this half a billion dollar investment in Southern California um, in really uh, breaking our love affair with the lawn. Um, and uh, it's been exciting to see these transformations occur. It's disturbing for me as a scientist to see that we are not actually measuring the water supply benefit of putting in these projects. So we're not doing the science around it to actually do that. And hopefully that's something that changes right away. It's very upsetting to me um, that, that, that that's what's happening. And there's other potential benefits as well that we could be getting ecologically, stormwater recharge, et cetera, that need to be quantified as well. 
and we haven't and we haven't done that. So I will conclude on uh, uh, with this uh, very complex slide to basically show you that at the end of the day, it is possible. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. But it is possible without building a whole bunch of desal plants that just looking at our local water supply in Los Angeles, maximizing recycled water, maximizing stormwater capture, improving water conservation, getting more out of our groundwater basins and, and, and managing them more aggressively in a conjunctive use manner uh, while monitoring them much more than we are right now. We can actually get to water self-sufficiency if we reduce our consumption to about 75 gallons per capita per day. That's not crazy. That's a, that's a number that is met in many, many countries around the world. Um, to give you perspective, you know, Santa Monica, ballpark nowadays, somewhere around 113, 115 gallons per capita per day. LA, sort of at the best, was at 106 gallons per capita per day. Long Beach has been under 100 for quite some time. So to get down to 75 by 2050, that's not that heavy of a lift. Um, and um, it, as some of you guys may have been following this stuff, it's a start, just like Sigma was a start on sustainable groundwater management. Um, uh, but you know, conservation is a way of life. Um, uh, those bills just passed this year, this last this week, um, and so that's obviously big news to at least move in that direction. We're going to start seeing water budgets occurring, um, and uh, um, you know, move hopefully forward on conservation much more than we have today. And with that, I'm talking way too much, um, but at least there's also. If you guys haven't seen this, there's obviously LA County Safe Clean Water Program will really be a big way to help us get there, which is this November on the county ballot. So take a look for that. Um, it will generate $300 million per year plus um, to really um, use stormwater as a resource, clean up our polluted waterways. So that's, that's my pitch. And then there's other water bonds as well, including Prop 65, Prop 68 coming up in um, June, and then I don't know the name of the water bond in November. Yes? I will give it up, absolutely. All right, thank you. We all are contemplating putting in gray water systems, rain harvesting systems. These are kind of these essential things you can even do locally at your own property, even if you're a multi-family uh, property owner. I know there's some in the audience. Um, these are great ways to locally preserve the rain that we do get, or as well as creating recycled water directly on site. And when having um, gray water on site is a lot less energy intensive than doing a center located treatment plant, especially in Santa Monica. So, hi, it's more like a working session. So, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get to some of the things that are happening at the state level. I didn't have time to do that. Again, not at a granular level and certainly not complete, but to try and give you a picture of some of the things happening at the state level to try and leverage more action, both of the things that the state controls, but also to leverage the really good work on the, on the ground. And bond funding is a big piece of it, not the only piece. This is, um, it's the elephant slide, but with the words that my husband hates a slide with this many words on it. He'll have words with Mark at the end, but I do think that Mark slides are really important because then as people can take them and then they've got that cheat sheet. So I'm, I'm more of a, I'm a lawyer, I'm a word person. Then of course, you know, this is a slide. Sometimes I have presentations where this is every other slide to make the point. And the water action plan that we talked about that I didn't get into detail, but this all of the above approach is really very much conservation, recycling, stormwater capture, integrated water management. What I want to talk about for a second, which is not that easy to snap your fingers and make happen, but where you look at our watersheds and you look at it from a flood control and a water supply and a water quality perspective. I mean, so much of our environmental um, infrastructure and management, let alone our regulatory authorities, have developed along these silos that may have made sense at the time but make absolutely no sense for getting things done and so part of the trick is figuring out how to get that multi-benefit consciousness so you can get what my friend Ellen Hannock calls more pop per drop from every drop of water and as I gave that example of just leaks and lawns that's one if you look at the county stormwater um, fee measure the whole, it's a grand play to be able to do that uh, in LA County and dealing with flood control districts, different jurisdictions, different cities, 
the water supply guys and the water uh, quality guys, I mean, those are different worlds. Even it's taken how many years just in the city of LA to have uh, what we have now, which is I think is an attempt, a really good faith attempt on the part of LA DWP and the sanitation department to work together on stormwater as a water supply, but also as a pollution source. When I was in public works, we were just the water quality deal with it people right at the beginning of the stormwater movement. Um, and the DWP folks didn't want to have anything to do with us. We had to fight with them about recycling. Now people are at least trying to do it, but they speak a different language. They have different boards, they have different authorities. So it actually takes a lot of uh, human work and money to make it happen. And if you don't even have the money, it becomes harder to make it happen. So I'm going to talk about finance a little bit as we go through this. I also didn't talk about safe drinking water for all communities, which could be a whole talk and uh, issue of our time. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the efficiency legislation, which did thankfully pass on Thursday, um, thank heavens, um, and we'll talk about it, but we also have a measure to uh, do a modest subsidy on behalf of all California households to get a pot of money to be able to subsidize, not pay for all, but subsidize O&M, o &M, operation and maintenance, for those small communities that can't get capital money, that can't get water, it won't happen without that. And that is really a big decision for us to cross-subsidize to make good on the human right to water legislation that passed in 2012 to the Water Action Plan uh, commitment. And we may not get there um, this year. We'll try our best. But again, thinking differently. And then I, I put this up, that whole watershed approach from top to bottom, it's, it's a neat diagram, but you actually have to do stuff about it to make it happen. Uh, Water 4.0, I actually really recommend by David Sedlak to any of you just want a basic on the history of water and the evolution of drinking water treatment in particular, wastewater treatment, and the, the opportunities to do much more integrated water management in a more cost-effective way so that, um, at least for urban California, if we do all this stuff, I'm not worried about that climate change nightmare. For ag, I am, and it's going to get smaller. There's no question it's going to get smaller, but you don't want to ravage it. So that's a an even harder conversation to have. So here I just want to give you a sense of some of the uh, what we are doing about it, and I'm sure I'll forget something. I don't want to minimize the legislative uh, progress, which has been significant having worked on this for 30 years or more, and frequently, as you heard me earlier, being most disappointed in my um, uh, friends and acquaintances, let alone the people I don't know, who get to elective office and seem to forget about doing anything and do it at the level of a they can put it in a brochure as opposed to the real doers like uh, Judy and Ben and others. I mean, it takes a lot of work. If this is high value, low glamour work, and we really need the people who are going to do this tough stuff. But I have to give the legislature credit for doing more in the last 10 years or a little bit less than they have in the last 30, in my view, of uh, working on these issues. The human right to water legislation that passed in 2012 is the first in the nation to make good on the say it doesn't give us a lot of tools, but it says this is where everybody needs to go. This is the most important thing. And what it has spawned is a lot of action on the part of our agency and others, but also uh, moving the drinking water program from the public health department over to us. So you had one agency that had to be responsible from source to tap. That means you're thinking about quality and quantity on the way down. It also gave an economy of scale for funding and technical assistance to those particularly small disadvantaged communities. We were pretty good at it, which is why the disadvantaged community advocates who were feeling that they were getting good engagement on the wastewater side wanted it on the drinking water side. But they too go hand in hand, as Mark pointed out, when you think about the opportunity um, for recycling and the like. We also are good at getting money out the door, frankly. And we've gotten a bunch of legislative tools that will allow us to consolidate some of the small ones. Uh, it, it allowed us and the Department of Water Resources and uh, the Office of Emergency Services to actually spend state money for people who are on domestic wells who we have no ability to uh, regulate at the moment. And, and the, biggest, um, the biggest opportunity came in East Porterville, which many of you may have heard of, which was the largest whole community that was just out of water. If you looked at a map of Porterville, it was amazing. I, I know some of the history of this, but you had Porterville with a giant rectangle cut out of it, which were people who were in East Porterville and who were all on domestic wells, been drinking crappy water for years, but they actually ran out of water, in part because this is where there are exceptions to any um, statement, because a lot of the recharge for that whole area came from a conjunctive use reservoir called Friant, which were low water rights priority. The water wasn't flowing anymore. We, of course, got blamed for that. 
there, it was Mother Nature um, and their water rights. Mother Nature and water rights can equal a pretty uh, hefty chunk, and the water wasn't recharging anymore, and so the wells went dry. You also had agricultural producers trying to produce more food, a good thing they felt good about, and they deeper wells, and then you end up with shallow groundwater wells for people drying up. And that, that happened all across the state, it was happening even before the drought, which is why we had the political will to be able to finally pass groundwater legislation, which took 100 years. That legislation, from the time we had a surface water uh, regulatory system, that was an interesting one where it had been impossible to even mention the word groundwater without people screaming and yelling at you. But it was a fascinating thing where I found going out in ag, and again, you're going to think, I actually don't drink that much when I drink, but I do drink frequently. <laughs> it's part of, you know, I told the governor that I drink more alcohol on behalf of the environment than anybody he knew when he was interviewing me. It was because the, you got to, to get past the sound bites, you have to talk to people. And talking with them over a beer or a cup of coffee, you get a very different story than what they can say in the political culture they're in. And so what I would say during this period is that I had tons of farmers in coffee shops and bars talking to me or even grabbing my arm saying, you have to do this because we want our grandchildren to be able to farm. But we just don't have the political ability to do it. I can't say it in a microphone. But, so you have to do this, but just don't say, I told you so. So you have to deal with the politics and the culture where you find it, but there was a lot of a groundswell of regular people in agriculture and elsewhere said we have to deal with this. So um, it's on the way, it's a little bit complicated, we'll talk about it in a moment. Water bond, huge deal. And that was because we had a water action plan, as opposed to the usual pork barrel, you get 200 for this, you get 100 for this, that Senator Allen was talking about. The governor said he was not gonna support a bond unless it was smaller than the original one, and unless it followed a plan. And we got it on the ballot and it passed. The voters were very generous. There's another one on the ballot, Prop 68, that has a lot more for parts and for water. And there's an initiative that will be on the ballot uh, in November that has about $8 billion. Will that solve everything? No, most of the money still is gonna come from the local. But believe me, it helps leverage and get projects done. And you can't do it without that money. We have a lot of improvements in our water rights system. I'll pass on that. I can talk about that with uh, water rights wants. But the key issue uh, has been measurement, finally. It, it took until 2016 for us to be able to have regs that actually require that every diverter has to measure what they take out and report it to the state board. Think about that. It, it's like the tools we have in water rights are interesting. Let me just say that. But that's a big deal because that, again, lays a foundation because once you have that data, you can actually have the next conversation and it's fair. The water efficiency legislation would take too long to talk about. I mean, it's very important. It's a game changer. I think it's where we got the framework for a different way of looking at efficiency, and it's based on climate, which is to move, move efficiency into the planning for California's water future in a way that might not happen. People like to build a big new thing. There are a lot of people pushing you to build a big new thing, whether it's a desal plant or a recycling facility. But remember, recycling water takes energy to do. It takes money to do. And efficiency is the cheapest way to extend your water resources. It's in the ratepayers' interest, and it's in, in the um, environment's interest. And this puts it front and center and forces water agencies to live within a budget, which right now is pretty big, but over time, I think, as climate change and other things get worse. Folks are gonna get better at tightening it down. We have all the tools to do that at the appropriate time. But that change in framework is a huge deal for us to think as a state, rather than just having every water agency. We have 411 large ones. That's a, a, above three, serving above 3,000 people for more than 50, um, 59, whatever it is, however many days a year. Um, and we have thousands more really teeny ones, but the big ones cover over 90% of the population. This forces them to put efficiency in indoors, outdoors, and leak, uh, leak prevention, which will get us on the right um, path. So a very big deal. And then we have that ONN fund um, pending. That's a big deal from legislation. So here are a bunch of other things from the Water Action Plan. A lot of money, obviously, but also we've used our um, our state revolving funds to get lots of loan dollars out. We've even gone to the bond market to get more money. We're about to go again because this is a moment in time where I think we've helped leverage the paradigm shift on recycling, but we need to do it on a lot more things. And these bonds have money for a lot of things. Um, 
across the board. I talked about conservation, moving the conversation to efficiency. We had those emergency regs during the worst drought in modern history. I mean, Mark and I may disagree about which tools to use at the right time, frankly, and I don't want to be the uh, boy who cried wolf and call something a drought when it's not. The key is to move towards efficiency all the time. And again, he, I am the glass half full to his glass half empty, and it's very he healthy for both of us to be friends with each other, because between us, you know, you can not go nuts. Um, and you try and be real and have hope. Um, we're also proposing permanent regulations to take some of those permanent emergency regulations and make them, uh, you know, sort of permanent, which are things like not we know hosing on the highway, when, uh, the sidewalk when a, uh, a broom would do, uh, not watering when it rains, uh, homeowners associations not being able to diss people who don't make their lawn, lawn a perfect shade of green, or have to keep lawn, all those sorts of things that are uh, in their hotels having to offer that you don't have to have your um, sheets washed, you're having arguments about what the drinking water thing in, uh, in restaurants, which I think is better in a real drought than every day because we want people to hydrate. Um, Etc. and it's better than them getting a Coke. Sorry, Coke, even though they're pretty good on water and Coke. But any of them. We're going to be doing water loss regulations um, that set that target uh, for folks. Um, and there's been a lot of climate money put in for leak reduction from the greenhouse gas reduction funds. That's a, again, Campbell's nose under the tent in the beginning. There's also money that went to upper watersheds in the May budget rebounds, which is important because there's a water benefit to um, managing forests well. Uh, integrated water management, I talked about it, I talked a little bit about recycled water. We did a lot to set standards uh, through the drought for outdoor use. We got through uh, indirect potable reuse, groundwater augmentation, which is probably the best one because then it's filtering down, it has resonance time, etc. You've got all kinds of safety measures. We got regs out for actually adding um, really highly treated water. It's beyond what goes into Santa Monica Bay by far uh, into reservoirs, but it has strict requirements on residence time and monitoring, etc. Your key is you want to make sure there are no burps going through a drinking water system and then public health first and foremost, but we're also working on regs for direct potable reuse, which will take some time and needs a lot of barriers and a lot of safety and probably very expensive to do at first until we show we can do it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, which is a much more unforgiving standard than anything for the um, environment, which isn't because the environment is less important, but it can handle more than you just don't want people to get sick. So, and the first the first players to mess that up will mess up recycling for everybody everywhere. So that's a big push for us. Stormwater capture, we've been trying to figure out how to incentivize people doing that hard work across silos and across geographies and our permitting. Not everybody loves it, but I think it's helpful. I think the funding, there's a bit of funding that we've been able to get out the door. I think the self-funding uh, with this measure that's on the ballot is going to be a game changer for Southern California, and then desal, we set very strict requirements for both the intakes and the discharge because those have a real impact on the marine environment. Most places are not going for it over uh, recycled water uh, and stormwater capture and exercising the groundwater basin just makes more cost uh, effective sense. A bunch of things talked about groundwater. There actually are a bunch of uh, experiments going on in the valley. The whole frying problem program is actually a recharge program, so there are examples of it in the valley, but not at the scale that we're going to need to have. Um, storage, just a moment on that, a lot of money's out there, people talk about the fights over big dams, the Water Commission has put out their scoring, not their um, ruling on which uh, projects are likely to get that 2.7 billion. Obviously some of the people who want to do big dams say it was all for two dams, and it wasn't if you read the language. And there's some interesting projects in there, including the Southern California project, in the San Gabriel Valley. San Gabriel Valley is one of the leaders in reach. I capture 90% of what comes out off the mountains, and they've been doing it for a long time, and they put in recycled water. I mean, LA just needs to look over there, and you can see um, some great models, but even they can do um, even more. But they have a really interesting project that will get water from the Sierras into the ground with fish ownership on it so that it can be called on and then released from a reservoir upstream when the fish need it in the delta. It's kind of cool. I encourage you to look at it. Complicated, but helpful. And some other interesting things. There are a bunch of agreements going on um, that can help deal with shortages in the future, or take dams out, etc. And that little footnote I just said bites nails and uses fingers because those things aren't done until they're done. 
There's a lot happening in the Delta I won't uh, talk about right now, but it's not all about water fix, which is something I can't talk about because I'm a judge on, but we're also updating those standards to leave more water uh, for fish in that arena. And there's a lot of water energy nexus work going on. I talked about a little bit about it. The CPUC has put out a calculator. We actually can calculate at a local level how much water conservation can yield you in energy efficiency and get money and credit for it. I'm oversimplifying it, but it makes a huge difference. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff on safe drinking water that we've done, I mentioned enough, uh, and this different approach. And we're finally getting going on some of the mountain meadow restoration that can hold water back. Uh, in, in lieu of what snowpack used to do, and then there's this whole push, including in the budget, but on a lot of fronts, to figure out how to actually manage forests so that you get bigger trees, sequestering more carbon, you thin it enough that the snow will fall and hit the ground and not, uh, not um, melt on the treetops, hit the ground but be shaded enough that it won't melt out, and what it gives us is a way to shift um, that scary hydrograph that Mark was talking about is it a, a million or a not? Oh, almost done, sorry. It's, it's pretty exciting work. And then again, I talked about enough of this. There's some, some great work happening on the ground that we're trying to facilitate that people are taking. Floodplain restoration uh, for birds and for fish and water supply and some great uh, agreements between agricultural community and environmental justice work on safe drinking water and pollution prevention in the valley. Uh, rice guys in Northern California have become the bird saviors, I won't get into that, and they're hoping to do the same uh, in many cases for fish by allowing these little fish onto their lands to get to the bugs and the food they need to fatten up before they run the gauntlet of predators uh, out to the bay so they can come back. And they've been doing testing on it, and we'll talk about our priorities, but in any event, it's not a complete list, but there's a lot going on and a lot we're trying to facilitate through regulation, encouragement, legislation, and uh, most importantly, funding. And now we're going to go local. So one of the things we're working on right now as she pulls up the presentation is an update to our sustainable water master plan. Um, we look out to 2040, but one thing we're doing a little differently is we are um, Look, I'm making noise. We're uh, looking at it every two years because things are changing so fast. Legislation is changing so fast. Technology. So one of the things we want to do is incorporate all of that. But one thing that started this past year um, that we will continue to modify um, into the future. Okay, that, uh, to make us long-term sustainable. And what that means by sustainable is looking at getting our water locally, but not just pulling it locally from our basins but sustaining that basin. What is a sustainable level of yield we can pull so that we're not depleting it? And then not depleting it during drought. What do we do to offset during drought? So we're looking at climate change models incorporating into our master plan so we can have a kind of a strategic plan that's quick and nimble to react as these things change very quickly and our climate changes. So one of the components we have is called water neutrality. And Karina's gonna talk about our water neutrality ordinance. It's pretty much one of the first in the nation, if not in the world, and they put it together, and they, it's, I, one of the reasons that I was really excited to come actually to Santa Monica is because they're doing some innovative um, programs and ordinances like this, so. Thank you, Melinda. So, my name's Karina, so I'm gonna talk about water neutrality as a tool to self-sufficiency. So, anyone who's not a part of our Santa Monica community, um, visiting from LA um, today at Climate Fest, the city of Santa Monica does have a goal to be water self-sufficient by 2020. Um, we do implement a variety of methods to help us reach that goal. So we have various infrastructure projects in the works. We also have various conservation rebates um, for commercial and residential properties. Um, we do have a booth outside, so please feel free to visit us. Our water conservation unit staff is here so we can answer any of those questions for you. Um, and we also have various policies for landscape, stormwater, um, and water neutrality is just one of these policies to help us reach that goal. So what is water neutrality? Water neutrality is a code um, that caps water use for new developments by limiting that project to the historical five-year um, water use for that individual parcel. This will apply to all new developments, um, including new structures within the plumbing fixtures, any new and large pools, ponds, and water features, um, at any time where um, 
there's a repair, alteration, and rehabilitation project where 50% or more of the exterior walls of the structural supports are demolished. So this code became um, implemented as of July 1st, 2017. Um, to break it down into a more simple version, so for example, if a parcel's baseline was 50,000 gallons per year, that was their five-year average, um, the projected water demand for that project would be 150,000 gallons per year. They would be required to offset 100,000 gallons per year to receive a permit to build in Santa Monica. So new developments can do a variety of options to offset those new gallons of water. Um, they can perform on-site or off-site plumbing fixture retrofits, or they can choose to pay an in-lieu fee to the city, um, which 100% of these in-lieu fees pay for the city's water neutrality direct install program. So the city, through its vendor, will install a variety of plumbing fixtures at various locations to offset that new water from that new development. So this is just a screenshot of our calculator. We are working to update this um, with a newer version um, by this winter. Um, so compliance-wise, how do you comply? Um, the water neutrality calculator, you just input into three sections, the information for your project for indoor fixtures, any outdoor water features, and the landscape and irrigation. And this will estimate the customer's projected water demand on the calculator. Um, as I mentioned, we do have various policies that we implement with the city of Santa Monica to reach our goal of water self-sufficiency. So one of these policies is the water use allowance program, which all water customers in Santa Monica are subject to reduce their water usage by 20% from their 2013 usage. Um, as part of participating in the water neutrality program, you are actually setting your project's water use allowance um, moving forward for your utility bills. So you will be subject to staying within the budget essentially that you allocate yourself during the um, building permit process and therefore if you exceed extra, extra, by extraordinary amounts, you may be subject to fees and fines from the city. So some of the program results, um, as you all know, this became implemented as of July 1st of last year. So we analyzed the first six months of the ordinance adoption and essentially 32 new development projects and pool projects have had to comply with this program. So of that, um, we calculated a total new water demand created by these projects equals 381,917 gallons per year. Of that breakdown, 20 of these uh, per permits were from pool and spas, um, which equated to 347,172 gallons per year. 12 of these were just new development projects, so these are a mix of single family homes, multifamily commercial projects. These came out to uh, 34,745 gallons per year that they generated as part of their new project. Uh, nine of the 12 new development projects had a projected water demand that was less than the five year historical baseline. So this is actually great news. It means that you know, these new development projects are actually building very highly efficient. They're using innovative you know, fixtures um, and they're actually slated to use less water than their five year baseline. So the Water and Charlie Direct Install Program, these are for people who choose not to perform on-site retrofits, but choose to pay an in-lieu fee to the city. So we have an estimated 199.8 gallons per flush tank toilets expected to be funded from this program so far, just within the first six months of its implementation. Um, without our marketing and outreach efforts yet implemented, which we will officially launch um, the Direct Install Program to all water customers this coming fall, we have nine properties on the wait list, um, and we have the entire Santa Monica Unified School District signed up as well, so that's potentially up to 14 campuses that will be impacted with retrofits um, to save water at all of our schools in Santa Monica. So our next steps, um, you know, our staff is always looking for ways to improve the effectiveness of this program, so we're continually analyzing results, um, speaking to developers, architects, to see how we can improve our program, um, and as well as our overall policies. So with that, um, this winter we're going to launch a online version of the calculator, which will be more user friendly. We're expanding the applicability um, to who these, uh, to this, to who this ordinance applies to. Um, we're going to, we're working on streamlining permitting for residential and commercial gray water systems. Um, we're creating more incentives for water efficient new construction, residential, and commercial properties um, to use on-site water efficiency measures. Um, so with that,
Um, hopefully, um, you know, with the implementation of water neutrality um, and all of the other efforts that the city is taking to reach um, water self-sufficiency, you know, us as a region, us as a state, can you know live more efficiently or live more efficiently um, and have a sustainable future for the next generation to enjoy California as much as we've been able to enjoy it today. So it is lunchtime, but if you're a super water dog like me, if you have any questions for the panel, um, I have one I need to brainstorm with Mark about getting to 73 gallons per capita day with 8.4 million people visiting per year for tourism. That's my, uh, I said compost toilets in every hotel. Uh, and uh, cats to give you showers. Yeah, uh, so we have some pretty ambitious goals, um, and I think this is a great city, and everyone that lives here definitely um, pitches in and does their part in, with enthusiasm, and we really appreciate that. Um, so if there's any questions from the state to the local to the world. There are now some other cities that are looking to implement it. I know that San Francisco has kind of a similar ordinance. Santa Fe is doing like a water offset, but that's more for like water banking. But this is really, was the first and really innovative um, concept of looking at that. And basically, the general thrust is whatever the demand is for your new facility, you have to either off, you have to provide offsets equal to, to what the new facility is somewhere else. Correct. So the idea is zero increase in water usage with development. Either on site or off site. Yes. And one of the things I encourage is we really want to push on site retrofits, improving your actual property, which is a benefit to you because you're making your actual property more efficient for just doing everything off site. Um, yes, so 20 of the 32 projects were pool and spa permits that were pulled with the city of Santa Monica. That's not a true reflection of all those that are currently in the permitting process. Those are only the 32 that were approved um, to build between the six months of the implementation. So our staff works hand in hand with most of these architects and developers through the permitting process to work with them to improve their on-site efficiency. Um, so they just may have not pulled a permit during that time, but um, you know, we, we do see a lot of pool and small permits in San Monica. <laughs> yes? is such more sustainable than sometimes what we can do as a big system. As you know, Santa Monica doesn't have a lot of land. Uh, so that some of the things you can do directly on your property for gray water can do like a simple project where you're getting water, gray water system where they have kind of almost like a kit system that goes to your clothes washer and then out to your garden to even more complex gray water systems. And that's what we're really looking forward to, in, especially like in the multi-family commercial sector, if everyone's been to Italy. Um, they have a new system, is looking to the point where now you're actually putting in your plumbing. So you're almost doing like a dual plumbing on site and it can't be done in single family. If, the kind of idea is if you're doing a major, major retrofit, that's the time to think about 
can you take it to the next level? And then you're basically reducing your sewer costs. I think you all in Santa Monica appreciate that. Because remember, your water usage, you're charged at 50% your usage times sewer. That's a big thing for me. Uh, so a lot of, especially if you have a lot of um, landscape, that it helps the more you can reduce. Do you want to say more? So how can we incentivize so that we're really looking at the mutual benefits of, of not just, okay, take out, save water. We have to look at the consequences and the interactions. Locally, we're really excited. We're going to be incorporating that in the next year. So, so Jerry, that's a great question. It's actually, I don't even know, it's, it's, it's one of the hot topics going on in the region right now. With all the urban forestry that's been done, none of the discussions have really been on what's what's ecologically appropriate. I mean, no one has an urban forest plan from the standpoint of ecologically what should be there, right? And and what's related to that, of course, would be if it's supposed to be there, then obviously the water demand for that tree is going to be much less than if you put something that's inappropriate in plant. But the, the pushback that's occurring for the people who've been doing street trees for a long period of time is that um, you know they want as much low maintenance as humanly possible, um, and and so that that can be a big issue. And then there's this complete misperception going on right now on vulnerability to um, parasites. So like the shot hole borer in particular um, is is an invasive species that's wreaking havoc um, on a wide variety of trees right now. And there's a thought among some of the old school people have been doing um, uh, urban canopy for a long time that for some reason that natives are more vulnerable. That's not true, but that sort of information that's out there ends up leading to more bad decision making on what to plant. But I think there's a general agreement from everybody that if you don't have adequate irrigation of the trees, they're going to be far more vulnerable to um, disease, far more vulnerable to pests, invasive pests. And so we just have to be much, much more ecologically sensitive in how we're um, building our urban canopy. And we just haven't done that yet. Even, even a city as progressive as Santa Monica, the ecological component has not been part of it yet. And that's what really needs to be done. I want to add to that one. It's a great question. It's interesting. It's also part of my biggest pain during the drought, which was we did really well briefing the media on the conservation targets and the numbers and setting it with numbers so it was easy to write a story. But if you talk to any of those reporters, they'll laugh about the fact that I begged them to write about watering trees throughout the whole time. And I was only successful with the San Gabriel uh, Valley Tribune and the Bakersfield, California, I think it's called. We only got two stories out of all of that, because they go, oh, yeah, 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 trees. And I, but every time we were talking about how important trees are, and we need them for climate change, we need them for health, we need them for a whole host of things in terms of that whole urban ecosystem, and it was really very difficult, and it, 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 it did play into some of our pullback on some of the drought messaging, because if you over-message it, people weren't watering anything, because we weren't getting the message out about how to water trees. It's a complex message, because you know, watering with the sprinkler is not best for the tree, because then you're just, well, they end up with shallow roots. You have to, you know, do the drip around them long term so that their roots go down, so they're going to be sustainable, but, you know, 
also from Australia, an amazing story where in Melbourne, I never say it right, they actually made a decision during the height of that incredible millennial drought to double their tree canopy. And they did it because they were thinking holistically, not just about water, acre feet, or whatever they call leaders, they use skill leaders there. Um, uh, they were thinking about their elderly dropping dead from heat stroke. It's a little hotter there than here even, but they also had, their mayor was a doctor and in the medical profession, and that they really spent an incredible amount of money to retool their whole downtown, to capture water from their watersheds, to capture water from all their stadiums. And if you know anything about Australia, they have more different kinds of football and soccer and rugby to play. There's stadiums everywhere, and they've got recycling facilities that take both, and it goes in underground. It looks just like it did before, but they've added more trees. They spent a lot to keep their trees and their parks which also helps you realize that England really is the mother country to Australia because the real height of the drought, and they said the thing that really switched everybody's mind on it was when the trees in their park started dying and their lawns in their parks were just gone and little kids were twisting ankles and they felt, and their gardens were dying and they felt that civilization as they knew it was ending and they went pedal to the metal on this recycling stormwater capture and gray water in all of its forms. So, I would say tree people is a good resource because they know the most about Australia and have been there and modeled their recommendations to LA based on that. There are a whole host of different systems, but the key is to make sure your your trees are watered or else, you know, we could end up having enough water for basic living. We can clean up every toxic and every pollution out there and we're going to live in a, a gray and lifeless landscape which is not where we want to live, so quality of life includes that urban forest. So thank you, and also it's a good mitigation. And just to plug this video, Santa Monica, really quickly, um, the Office of Sustainability and the Environment does provide free water gator bags. We hold 40 gallons of water um, just for new um, trees to help get established. So we offer for free from our office, and as well as the Urban Forestry uh, team from the Public Landscape Division, we also offer free um, street tree consultation. So the street trees are um, in the parkway area, they're in between your yard and the street. So if you have any street trees there and concerned about your tree health, um, watering schedule, you can contact them for a free consultation. They'll come to your property and assist you in person. Um, yeah. So her question was to talk about how tourism is impacting looking at uh, self-sustainability. And this is one thing that is kind of interesting when, like Mark talks about the 70 gallons per capita per day in like Long Beach and looking at the statistics, because one of the things we broke down are gallons per capita per day for residential. So that would be just multifamily, single family residential usage. It's about 73 gallons per capita per day. But when we add in the 8.4 million people that come into town, not to mention the 93,000, just a little under 93,000 people that come in every day for jobs, and our population is just about that. We double our population every day. So it's kind of an added hurdle in re reaching our goal there. So one of the things is to look at, um, we're looking at what can we do as a normal plan to be self-sustainable, but then we're looking at, well, how can we actually look into this big area of usage that most cities don't have. I mean, I've, most cities I've worked with, they never would have this many people, even a bigger city. Uh, so one of the things is being very strategic about where we do water efficiency improvements. So one of the thing is, for example, water neutrality, we were originally looking like, oh, let's mix it with single family, multifamily, but we have to be realistic. Let's put it in downtown commercial pier because that toilet or urinal I replaced there has huge savings compared to one in a single family home where they have four toilets. I don't want to put it in the guest room that one person uses every three years. So it's really kind of being strategic about that, but we have to be really more aggressive. We're not looking at putting in what's the standard Cal Green toilets 1.28s. We're asking to put in 0.8s. So we're almost dropping it by half even further. Um, this is another issue because when we look at downtown, um, our, what we plan for sewer 
because it is again all tied, we're finding that our sewer lines are becoming compact to the capacity. So if we are strategic about replacing the toilets and urinals and faucet areas and reducing our sewer flow, we actually solve two problems in one, which is really important. So it's really looking at how, where can we best reach there and then doing some educational campaigns. One of the other components of tourism um, in talking to economic development is that the shift of who's coming to Santa Monica. We're actually getting more people coming from abroad. They stay longer. So, I mean, that's good for our economy, but that's also they're staying longer in more hotels and using more water. And then understanding where they're coming from, how the relationship with water is, and then how we can message to them effectively when they're here that they're using water sustainable. Yes? Sacramento and 
Uh, they, they've really connected more with Southern California because of the drought, and there's now not just a local collaboration, but um, more communication and, and sharing of ideas on a state level, which is great. I was just going to talk about the Bionic Creek Revitalization Project, and we have formed a task force, and a couple of weeks ago we had our first large task force meeting at the Stoneview Nature Center over in Culver City, and actually had a really good turnout, about um, like 50 people or so from all around the region. So we had some Santa Monica representatives, City of LA, we actually had our, an Army Corps representative show up, which was a miracle and um, the water district and a bunch of other regional players and uh, it was really uh, good to see we had some tree people mujeres de la, de la tierra show up um, so i think that there is this recognition that we need to do better and everybody wants to it's just about getting out of our offices making the time to make it happen um, but fortunately we've got this creek that travels through multi-jurisdictions and there's compelling reason for everybody to show up um, to the party and, and contribute. So, so are there any other questions? Because I want everyone to eat so you're not really grumpy when you come for drip irrigation. Any, yeah. any other question? That's it. Well, thank you all so very much. For your